Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, my name is Maya and I'm the Assistant Director of Student Programs at the Berkeley Institute. Um, the Berkeley Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies is an academic hub for engagement on Israel studies as well as Jewish law, thought, and identity. Um, and the Institute's programs promote student and faculty engagement through opportunities for research, events and programming, mentorship, bringing visiting faculty and scholars to UC Berkeley from Israel in a wide variety of fields, our undergraduate fellowship program, um, and more. Um, so please learn more about us at the website if you haven't yet, though I see a lot of familiar faces here. Um, and, and thank you for joining us today for the first event, um, the first student event of the semester, um, which is also the first event in the series that we are running this fall titled Conversations About, um, so Black and Jewish Conversations About Race and Identity, Community Relations and Commitments to Social Justice. So this series will address such topics as the history of Black Jewish alliances from civil rights era to today, which is what we're talking about. With, with Mark today, um, the experience of Black and Jewish intersectionality within the fight for racial justice, and more. Um, upcoming events in the series include a September 30th discussion with Alana Kaufman, Executive Director of the Jews of Color Initiative, um, a diversity and inclusion training on October 16th, and um, tentatively a sign poetry performance um, focused on Black and Jewish intersectionality, but more details will come. Um, TBA. So we also have a lot of other events coming up at the Institute, including next week on uh, Israel US China relations with visiting faculty UDA Iran and the Institute's co faculty director Ron Hasner, um, and an event on comparative elections law October 8th, um, comparing Israeli and US systems. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and today we're very lucky to have Mark Dollinger here for this first program. Um, Mark Dollinger holds the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Endowed Chair in Jewish Studies and Social Responsibility at San Francisco State University. He served as a research fellow at Princeton University Center for the Study of Religion, as well as um, Andrew W. Mellon, postdoctoral fellow and lecturer in the humanities at Bryn Mawr College, where he coordinated a program in Jewish studies. Um, he's the author of Black Power Jewish Politics, Reinventing the Alliance of the 1960s, as well as other books, including California Jews and the Quest for Inclusion, Jews and Liberals in the Modern America. So before I turn it over to Mark, I just want to firstly thank um, two students, um, Kwame Baheja and Rebecca Steinberg, who have helped us um, both in conceiving of this series and this event and thinking about the content and speakers and programming, and as well as um, the implementation, creating our flyers and marketing and outreach and getting the word out to all of you. So thank you so much to the two of you. And I look forward to hearing from you two as we start off the Q&A. Um, before um, before we open it up. So one more note is that we are recording this event um, and we will be recording, but we'll be um, only publishing the, the portion of the event that is um, the public talk. We won't be publishing or saving anything in terms of Q&A and we won't have any names or anything like that um, visible. So please do feel comfortable um, asking your questions freely. I just wanted to flag that that first portion is gonna be is going to be recorded for our for our website. So thank you to all, and I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Uh, without further ado, thank you, Maya. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, as I set up the share screen, oh, good, we're already set up. I want to tell how exciting it is to actually be speaking to a Berkeley audience, because as you'll see in a moment, uh, this book actually started on the Berkeley campus. And usually when I give the talk, it's the same talk everywhere I give it. I have to give a lot of explanation about Berkeley. And, uh, and now we can just uh, get right into it because uh, here we are, or at least that's where we were because the last few days have not looked anything like this. I arrived on the campus of Cal Berkeley as a first year student in the fall of 1982 to date myself. Of course, as so many of us were and are ready to change the world, and for those who are not familiar with our campus, this is, of course, Mario Savio during the free speech movement, um, where he was uh, changing the world. And, and here would be, of course, the view of Sprawl Hall from the other direction. And here I tell folks who don't know about Sprawl Plaza and the walkway and the tabling that goes on, at least when we can be on campus. And uh, my first day of school, I, of course, walked down and went to the first table, of course, Berkeley Hillel, it's called Jewish Student Board for me back in the day. And I let folks know that that uh, Berkeley Hillel t-shirt has changed over the years. 
I like it without the vowels where it could say Berkeley or Barack Lee, a storm is upon me or broccoli, the vegetable. Um, for a few years, they put in vowels to, uh, to, to keep the Hebrew speakers clear on that. But after visiting the Jewish student table, I of course went to the next table I needed to go to, which was the Black Student Union table. And there I met one of my classmates and proclaimed, let's start a Black Jewish dialogue. And when I said that, he burst out laughing and kept laughing until I have to believe he saw some of the uh, shock, horror, and embarrassment on my face. And um, with compassion, he did all he could do to control himself and to ease what was a really awkward moment. He said to me four words. He said, hey, I'm from Harlem. Now, on one level, I knew what Harlem was, you know, an African-American neighborhood in Manhattan in New York City. But on a deeper level, I understood that he was trying to communicate more to me. And that is, for me, a white liberal Jewish kid who grew up in the suburbs of LA, that my life experience was a whole lot different than growing up black in Harlem. And it was only because we both landed on the same piece of real estate of the Berkeley campus to start our years of college that we would even meet and have that kind of interaction. I certainly didn't know it in the fall of 82, but uh, that was the moment that actually started this book on black power and Jewish politics. So good afternoon and thank you to everybody who, who helped organize this today. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. And especially I noticed I've got some of my historian colleagues also listening, so great to have you here. And I'll just say for everyone's benefit, we're gonna talk about three things. First and the easiest is history, which we'll just define as the study of the past. Really, I'm interested for the history majors out there in what's called historiography. Historiography is the history of history. How it is that different generations of historians can look at the same moment through a different lens. So really what my contribution today will be is more challenging earlier versions of our history than it is telling the history itself. Because memory and Jewish memory and American Jewish historical memory, which is what I love to think about, is turns out to be a little bit tricky. What actually happened, what we remember actually happening, what we think happened, oftentimes can be very different. And finally, the historian's craft. And I think I'm in trouble now with my colleagues because I was a history major at Berkeley. I did my grad work at UCLA, so I'll blame them. But I learned in graduate school, at least, that the job of the academic historian was to be a third person, dispassionate scholar who can look at any time and place in history through their own critical lens and write a book on it. If we do a good job, the reviews will say we did a good job. If we did a lousy job, we'll get bad reviews. But it has less to do with our own personal identities and more to do with the skill set we bring to our craft. So I was almost done with this book when I was having a conversation with a colleague of mine at SF State, an African-American man who is in communication studies. And, uh, and he was uh, talking about his course, which is ethnicity, race, and communication and the ways in which his students' ethnic and racial identities inform the way they communicate. And, um, and he said to me, as we got into this, he said, you know, my blackness is in every word I teach and every word I publish. And then he pushed it a little further. He said, you know, your whiteness is on every word you teach and every word you publish, except you don't have to say so. And of course it dawned on me, I'm a white man who, about to publish a book whose first two words are black power. So I decided I needed to break the rules I learned, at least in graduate school, um, and, um, and add a preface. I already had an introduction, so I called this a preface. I called my editor up at the press and I said, I need to break the rules of academic history. I'm gonna insert myself in a narrative. And um, I told the story of, of sort of that lesson at Cal Berkeley and even some, some stories from growing up. Um, so that any reader looking um, through the pages of the text will read and learn not only from what is written, but will also be able to frame that however they wish by knowing as much about me as the author as they can. 
So um, this may appear to be the 25th letter of the English alphabet, indeed it is, but I would like to say it is also a visual representation of the historiography of black Jewish relations in the post-war period, a very fancy way of saying, and I use my cursor here if I can find it, there we go. Let's just say in the upper left are black Americans, over here let's have white Jews, and we can see that they're apart at the top of the Y. But as time goes on, they meet here in the center. This would be the Black Jewish Alliance of the Civil Rights Movement with King and Heschel that we, we learned so much about. And look, they march together throughout history. I argue if you look at the first historiographic generation, the first collection of books and articles and even journalistic accounts of uh, civil rights and Jews, it's gonna be a version of this letter Y. Two diverse communities coming together and marching in solidarity. Of course, it's a problematic historiography if you look beyond the mid-60s, because in the mid-60s, the alliance split with the rise of black power, at least that's what the historical memory said. So the next generation of books, we'll just say it's more like the letter X. Blacks on here, white Jews over here, they come together in the middle of the X from about the mid 50s with the Brown decision or the Montgomery bus boycott, ending in the mid 60s, Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting, Voting Rights Act of 65, rise of black power, black nationalism. And now down here at the bottom, or at the bottom of the X where the two communities are split again. Now, this of course is, is before the murder of Floyd and all of the protests and the racial reckoning going on. And you know maybe we talk about that in Q and A, but there's a possibility we're in a moment now where we're actually gonna get proximity um, between the two groups. So um, what I'm gonna do is um, a little bit of a, of a quiz for all of you. And, and because we don't have much time, I'm just gonna have you think about it for yourselves. I'm about to put up a, a primary source historical document or, or quotation from one. What I want you to do is guess who said it and when. So I've done three things to the document. First, I got rid of who said it, I got rid of when, so you have to guess. Third, I did this talk at the Hartman Institute in New York, they're very smart there, and they know that over time, the words used to describe black Americans have changed. So they were able to date the document by what word was used to reference uh, black Americans. So I want you to know that I've changed all those words around. You can have no confidence that whatever word you're reading has anything to say about it. Um, and uh, Maya, actually, let me just ask you if I can in real time, can I ask if people want to unmute if they want to give a guess on this or, or put it in the chat? Would that, would that work for you guys? Okay, so here it is. I'll read it to you and type it in the chat or unmute yourself when I finish reading it if you want to uh, offer something. I'm opening my chat here. Okay, black power stresses, black initiative, black self-worth, black identity, black pride. Black power seeks the growth and development of black economic and political power. Black power seeks black leadership development. So who would have said this and when? Any thoughts? Feel free to unmute and just uh, let us know what you think. Anyone brave to venture? Oh, Malcolm X, thank you, Alexander. Alexander has given us Malcolm X, and this is such a good Malcolm X quote. Of course, by the way, if you know, Malcolm X, leader of the Nation of Islam in this period. Black power stresses black initiative, self-worth, identity, and pride, seeking growth and development of black economic and political power. Um, all right, and Madeline was also gonna guess Malcolm X. Thank you very much, uh, Madeline, for doing that. So now we're gonna do the big reveal. Here is the picture of Malcolm X. Oh wait, that's not Malcolm X at all. That's a picture of the American Jewish Committee from 1969, because it turns out, and by the way, Alexander and Madeline, when I read this, of course I thought it was Malcolm, right? Or Stokely Carmichael, the leader of the Black Power Movement. That's who should have said, um, I'll bring it backwards here. That's who should have said this. Um, but it turns out it's AJC. And for those who aren't familiar, the American Jewish Committee is a national Jewish self-defense organization. Politically, it's in the center, maybe even center right a little bit. And um, in 1969, they're saying positive things about black power. 
So when I saw this in the archives, I thought historical memory is off, the historiography is off. There's got to be a reason why a Jewish organization that I would never expect to be saying this was saying it, and they were saying it in public. All right, this is actually not a quote, it's just a straight up question. How would the Anti-Defamation League respond to the Nation of Islam, which was Malcolm X's organization, Elijah Muhammad before that, Louis Farrakhan now? Uh, anyone in the chat or want to unmute on, on what they think the ADL would say in response? And I'll let you know, by the way, to Alexander and Madeline, you gave what I call the correct, incorrect answer. Thank you. It was set up so we'd say Malcolm or Stokely. And of course, the ADL, which is the nation's leading organization fighting anti-Semitism, the Nation of Islam is anti-Semitic. So um, of course, the ADL is going to condemn the Nation of Islam as the ADL does today. And certainly Louis Farrakhan hears a lot of, of that from, from national Jewish organizations. Except you go to the sources and you discover that in 1959, Time Magazine wrote a cover story on Elijah Muhammad, who was then the leader of the Nation of Islam. And he was really the one who popularized the group. And it was what you call in journalism a hit piece. It was really critical of Elijah Muhammad. And when I was in the archives, I found an internal memo sent from the head of the ADL to all of his regional offices. And it had a stamp on it, confidential, not for publication. And here's what the memo said. Time Magazine notwithstanding, we have no documentable evidence of anti-Semitism on the part of the Temples of Islam movement or Elijah Muhammad. How could it possibly be that the ADL, after reading a Time Magazine piece, is going to argue that there's no documentable evidence of anti-Semitism? Something is going on here in the late 1950s. So, um, how would the American Jewish Committee respond? Well, we have to assume similar to the ADL. And of course, I think you know where this is going today, right? This is the correct, incorrect answer on each piece. It turns out that the AJC heard in 1959 as well that Elijah Muhammad was coming to a Northern New Jersey metropolis. Sorry about that. Um, the Northern New Jersey metropolis, let's just call that Newark, shall we? Uh, hold on, I'm gonna get rid of that. Okay. Um, the Nor and in New Jersey, in this metropolis, they, um, they, they were afraid that he was going to promote anti-Semitism. So they wanted to go undercover and surveil Elijah Muhammad. And uh, well, there were no black Jews in the Newark, New Jersey AJC office to go undercover and having a white Jew in a clipboard showing up is not a good way to go undercover. So in an arrangement which we may find troubling, the AJC made a deal with the city of Newark and the Human Rights Commission of Newark and they found a black man from the Civil Rights Commission of Newark to go undercover and to surveil Elijah Muhammad. And he reported that between 1,500 and 2,000 people attended. And Elijah Muhammad spoke for an hour and a half to two hours and made a cryptic statement that, quote, they killed Jesus and he was preaching good. So when the AJC finds out that Elijah Muhammad says they killed Jesus uh, and he was preaching good, their response was that they were more concerned with the anti-white statements and they did not consider him anti-Semitic, even though he had just given the classic anti-Semitic trope of, of Jews as, as Christ killers. So the thesis I came up with this for the book was that this is more a reflection of the um, liberal Cold War anti-communist consensus of the 1950s, which did its best to center things like King and Heschel and did its best to marginalize radical thinkers who were on the outside. And if you needed to basically lie about them in order to deny platform to those that were coming from the far left, you know, in this case, then you were willing to do that. Um, so when we see the way in which Jewish organizations respond to Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam now, to me, it's more a reflection of changing attitudes within the Jewish community than really any changing attitudes um, within the Nation of Islam. Text three. Um, 
And by the way, I'm getting more questions in, in the Zoom chat. I'm afraid I'm gonna to have to keep going for time and we'll be able to get to those hopefully at the Q&A. The longstanding African-American distrust of white people, born of oppression, is manifesting itself in a growing spirit of go it alone. Blacks were already reevaluating their alliances, had come to know their strength in the political and economic arenas. And the person who wrote this predicted a period of mutual irritation and misunderstanding followed by a spike in new and more active forms of black anti-Semitism. This is a prediction. Well, first of all, it's a statement of race relations for real between white Jews and blacks to say there's a longstanding black distrust of white people. It was born of oppression. And guess what? There is in black America a growing spirit of go it alone, that the alliances that had been in place are being reevaluated. Blacks are knowing their strength. And guess what, folks? There's going to be mutual irritation and, understand, and misunderstanding. And there is going to be new and more active forms of anti-Semitism coming from Black America. Beware is what this person is saying. So who said it and when? It turns out Nathan Edelstein again of the ADL. And the key here is 1960. Because the historiography, the historical memory has us in 1960 with everyone getting along and everything's great and everything was, was great until black militancy and black power ruined it. And they ruined it by kicking out whites and kicking out Jews and the whole, the whole idea of interracial alliance ended in the mid sixties. But now let's go back. If in 1960, a white male national Jewish leader is announcing in a public publication, which this was, that there's a longstanding distrust, that there's oppression, that there is go it alone. And guess what? Black anti-Semitism is on its way. None of us historically can be surprised that any of this happened because it was actually predicted five years, four or five years before it happened. A segregated system is not merely an unfair system, but it's wasteful and inefficient. Nevertheless, we do not believe that a federal law to equalize educational opportunity by public subsidy should be used as a means to attack the segregated school system. So long as the law guarantees that states having segregated schools do not discriminate financially against children in the minority schools, we believe the bill should be supported. This was a bill to give federal government aid to public schools. Usually state governments uh, pay for education. And after World War II with the rise of the Cold War, the federal government realized if you're gonna beat the commies, we're gonna need to throw more money at education and the federal government's gonna have to do it. So this is testimony before the Senate Subcommittee on Education about a bill. And uh, for the pre-law students who are here, and since this is a Berkeley Law event, um, you know, 1954 was the Brown decision. And we probably remember that the Brown decision said, separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. And uh, what, we, what you may not know is the Supreme Court case that Brown overturned. It was the 1896 case of Plessy versus Ferguson. Now that was interstate railroads. Um, but the idea was in 1896, the court ruled you could have separate black cars and white cars as long as they were funded the same. So what we have here is um, testimony to the Senate subcommittee that's supporting Plessy, and that's opposed to the Brown decision. So long as the law guarantees states having segregated school systems do not discriminate financially, we believe the bill should be supported. So this is a Jim Crow segregationist piece of testimony, which we would expect from a white Southern Senator who clearly wants to keep Jim Crow in place. So let's look at our white senator. Oh, there he is, Rabbi Stephen S. Wise. Stephen S. Wise, the leading rabbi of his generation, personal friends with Franklin D. Roosevelt, founder of um, the Free Synagogue of New York, the leader of the American Zionist movement, and not someone we would expect to be arguing Plessy. And you'll look at the year 1947. So this is you know, a few years before the Brown case of 54. So he didn't know Brown was coming. And he argued Plessy. Now, to give a little bit of background and perhaps a little bit of mercy on Rabbi Weiss, 
he went down, for, he took the train from New York down to DC to testify to support public schools. That's a good rabbinic thing to do, you know. After he gave his testimony, the white Southern senators approached him and they said, you know what's gonna happen? You're all gonna give money to our schools and you're gonna wanna change Jim Crow and it's not gonna happen. So they told the rabbi, they said, we're putting an amendment to the bill. The amendment's gonna say, give us the money. You can't change segregation. And rabbi, we want you to support the amendment. And by the way, if we don't get the amendment, no children are gonna get any money from the federal government because this bill will never leave committee. What do you do if you're Stephen S. Wise? Well, he made his call. And for his morality's sake, he opened with a segregated system is not merely unfair, but it's wasteful and inefficient. This was his way of saying, I don't support Jim Crow. Nevertheless, comma, and now he made his deal. This is called um, white liberal gradualism. You can't bring social change all at once. You've got to go step by step. Wise realized better to get some money to some kids, even though you can't get all the money to all the kids, and we'll work on the race issue later. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was 18 years old when this happened, so he wasn't there. But just for fun, let's put Dr. King in the room. Would he have agreed to that compromise? I don't think so at all, because his point was racial justice. And this law not only didn't help in racial justice, this, this law actually doubles down and reaffirms Jim Crow because it shows that the federal government will now make sure that its monies are, are distributed in that kind of way. I'm tired of the philanthropy of rich white men towards your race. I want to see you fight your own battles with your own leaders and your own money. We white men of whatever creed or faith cannot fight your battles for you. We will stand shoulder to shoulder with you until you can fight as generals all by yourselves. All right, it says we white men of whatever creed. It's a white man. And you probably got this far that it's a white Jewish man. And now the question is, what white Jewish man is tired of the philanthropy of rich white men towards your race? So this is a white Jewish man speaking to a black audience. I wanna see you fight your own leaders, your, your battles with your own leaders and your own money. And here is this white Jewish guy says, we cannot fight your battles for you. We're gonna stand shoulder to shoulder, but guess what? You need to fight as generals all by yourselves. This is a, I would say, radical leftist Jewish leader who understood the inevitability of black power and understood the limits of white Jewish liberalism. And, and perhaps, you know, this is like a communist, right? Or a socialist or somebody who's way off to the left. Let's see who it was. Joel Springarn, 1914. Springarn, the founder of the NAACP with his brother Arthur and W.B. Du Bois, the first African-American to earn the PhD from Harvard. And there's two keys here. First of all, this is not some random radical leftist nobody talks about. This was probably the most important Jewish progressive political leader of his generation because he founded the NAACP. And the other key is it's 1914. This is 50 years before Black Power, which means the entire historical narrative and understanding about the split over the rise of Black militancy, over anti-Semitism in the Black community, over the idea that interracial alliances have their limits was nothing new and was known all the time and has existed in the literature even if we have not embraced it uh, in journalism or, or in popular culture. Well, for all this, I'll say that when I originally started the book, it wasn't even supposed to be on black power. The first title was Turning Inward. I was actually interested in how American Jews turned inward in the 60s and mostly into the 1970s. And when I started learning about turning inward, that's when black power kept coming up as I learned more and more about the Jewish turn inward. So. Um, Perhaps the saddest element in this whole frightening picture is in the fact that Jews are the people best able to understand the rhetoric of black power, even though they're most directly on the firing line of its attack. I, I love this quote because this person talks about a frightening picture. Um, and clearly they say black power, so we know it's, it's mid sixties or later. So there's a sad thing going on. There's a frightening picture where Jews really understand black power, even as Jews are on the firing line of black power's attack. 
against whites and, and specifically against Jews, if you want to look at anti-Zionism and in some cases, anti-Semitism. So um, by the way, back in the day when we could do this talk actually in person, I divided everyone into groups and everyone got one quote and they had to write down their answer and they couldn't change it once they realized that their answer is going to be wrong no matter what. So people would put the wrong answer down here. The right answer is Rabbi Arthur Hertzberg. 1966, Columbia University professor, famed author, wrote the Zionist idea, a whole lot of books. And I was really impressed that in 1966, which is a really intense time in the relationships between blacks and white Jews, he is arguing publicly that it's really sad that Jews should not be running away from what's happening. In fact, um, Jews should understand what's going on in black power. And here we have it. The positive aspect of black power is its search for ethnic identity. This we should be able to understand and approve. The American black today is in this respect retracing precisely the experience of American Jews a generation or two ago. And you can probably guess the rabbi, it sounds Roland Gittleson, Temple Israel of Boston in a sermon from 1969. And I tried to get my best old white man picture for, for Gittleson because Gittleson in 1948 was put on Truman's White House Commission on Civil Rights. In the 50s and 60s, his congregants were going south and getting arrested and getting put in jail in Parchment in Mississippi. So if there was any old guard Jewish leader who didn't like the rise of black power for ruining all the good stuff that came before it, I would put Gittleson top on the list. Yet he told his congregation, not only that there's a positive aspect of black power, but this we Jews is what he said, should be able to understand and approve. He used the word Negro instead of black, um, but he pushed it further. He said the rise of black power is retracing American Jewish history from a generation or two ago. There was a time when American Jews were marginalized and had to fight to get into the mainstream. So now he is actually creating a new alliance with black power at a moment that most people see black power as antagonistic to what's going on. What ethnic group benefit most from affirmative action in the 60s? I have to tell you, in order to get affirmative action, you have to be a federally designated historical minority group. Jews were not designated as such. Um, so the typical correct, incorrect answer is black Americans because ostensibly, of course, that's what affirmative action is supposed to help. Um, but you know that's the correct, incorrect answer. It actually wasn't um, African Americans. It was Jews. How could it be Jews when Jews were not eligible? Because women were eligible as a designated minority. Jewish women were, were better prepared for admission to college and graduate school and professional careers. So the preponderance of Jewish women um, in, in the professions and, and in ed higher education made all of the Jews the number one beneficiary. So now, especially I'll just mention in passing, you know, we now have a ballot proposition on affirmative action. The argument about meritocracy and the idea that affirmative action is bad for the Jews is a gendered argument to be sure, because if we are actually going to see which of the groups benefit most, you can't say that, that white Jews didn't benefit as well because actually white Jews are number one on the list. Well, when I was in the archives working on my dissertation, um, I was looking at the freedom rights from 19, from the 60s. And when I went to what was then called a card catalog, um, I found Freedom Ride 1971, which was clearly a typographical error on a card. But I pulled the, the folder and sure enough, it was 1971. But as you can see, it was a Soviet Jewry Freedom Ride, rather than a Freedom Ride for, for, for Blacks in the South. And uh, I thought this was, this was extraordinary, that in the Soviet Jewry movement, they were using the very language of the civil rights movement. And then under, after more investigation, I learned that a third of the Soviet Jewry activists were trained in the, in the civil rights movement. That, um, that this was one of the earliest mass protest democracy is in the streets, Jewish centered um, movements. And well, they used anti-communism in order to get support from the United States Senate because the Senate may be less interested in helping Jews, they're gonna be very interested in making the Soviet Union look bad. Well, as an academic historian, if you're gonna use anti-communism as your tool to help Jews, 
Soviet Jewry movement should have happened in the early 50s, at the time of McCarthy and McCarthyism, because that's when you can leverage it. Except in the early and mid 50s, the last thing American Jews finally getting into the white suburbs wanted to do was get in the streets and march and protest for Jews. They were doing all they could to assimilate. The Soviet Jewry movement nationalizes in 1964. And I would argue it was because the Black Power movement made it culturally, ethnically acceptable to be proud of who you are and to literally go into the streets in order to do it. So in the Soviet Jewry movement, and I have a chapter on that in the book, uh, I would argue that we would not have had that had we not had Black Power. Same with Zionism. In 1948, of course, American Jews supported Israel, especially after the Shoah, the Holocaust. But after 1967, the reaction of American Jews to Israel's victory in the Six Day War was extraordinary. $18 million was raised in one hour at a New York City luncheon. The United Jewish Appeal campaign doubled its fundraising in the year after the war. 7,500 Jewish college students got on airplanes and flew to Israel to support the cause. And how about this one? National public opinion polling found 97% of American Jews expressed strong, strong sympathy for Israel. Can you imagine 97% today of American Jews expressing strong sympathy for Israel? And I argue there is a strong connection between the rise of black nationalism and the notion that American Jewish nationalism now can follow suit. Rabbi Dove Peretz Elkins in Philadelphia said black power is nothing more and nothing less than Negro Zionism in one of his sermons. Hertzberg, Stokely Carmichael, he said, who is the leader of black power, he called him the most radical kind of Negro Zionist. He talks exactly the language of those Jews who felt most violently angry at the sight of Hitler and most hurt by the good people who stood aside. Oh, our dear friend Rabbi Gittleson, the black power advocate, is the Negro's Zionist. Africa is his Israel. Um, and here's my favorite one. Um, let's see. Okay, yes, yes, on the timing. I'll finish it up right now. Um, Cal Berkeley started its education abroad program after the Six Day War. Um, and I could only find one piece on it, but it was great. Um, they showed up at the Hebrew University in bell bottoms and beads and marijuana and lots of hair and the whole scene going on because they were going back to to find, find their people and to be authentic Jews. And then they met their Israeli counterparts, fresh out of battle, clean cut, the elite intelligentsia of Israel. And they saw these Berkeley undergrads and thought that, thought that they were freaks. So if you can imagine that picture, I would argue that what was going on here around Zionism actually had more to do with um, America in the 60s than it did actually with Judaism. Um, there was an ethnic revival, a religious, a religious revival as well. Um, the Jewish Catalog was the second most popular book by the Jewish Publication Society in this era after the Torah. This was a how to be Jewish DIY set for a generation of youth who never learned that growing up and, uh, and wanted to learn more about being Jewish. All right, Berkeley students, you'll love this. This is the Berkeley Radical Jewish Student Union of the era. I am told this is David Beale. I, I don't recognize that as David Beale, but somebody um, who's in this picture told me that that's who it was. They, with the Stanford Radical Jewish Student Union, created not a sit-in, but a pray-in at the Jewish Federation in San Francisco, demanding greater funding for Jewish education. So I love that they took the sit-in, they made it a pray-in, they, li they linked it with their Berkeley leftism and their Jewishness, um, and then they were, there, the, there they were. Black power went to the political right. The Jewish Defense League, even though it was a racist organization, loved the Black Panthers of Oakland. In fact, Mayor Kahani, the founder of the JDL said, you know, blacks are gonna pick up weapons to protect themselves. Jews need to pick up weapons to protect themselves. And then we see it. So we've had an X and a Y. I introduce you to the letter Z. Yes, blacks and Jews here at the top, marching together until black power, oh no, it goes all the way back because they separated, but look what's happened since then on a parallel path, they're certainly physically apart, but basically doing the same thing over time. And just to close, because I know that a lot of coffin's coming next for you, which is great. 
And I want to let you know, Ilana and I were having lunch in Berkeley when this book was just finishing at, at Gather, which is our favorite place to eat in Berkeley. And we were talking about what was then the 50th anniversary of the Selma March, when rabbis and the NAACP were marching from Selma to DC for voting rights. It all sounds good. Except Ilana said, where am I in the Facebook pictures? What if you're black and Jewish? In fact, black Jewish relations itself is a problematic term because blacks and Jews can only relate if Jews are white. So the phrase itself erases Jews of color. And then she looked to me and she said, and by the way, Mark, you've written 200 words on blacks and Jews, 200 pages on blacks and Jews, and not a single page on black Jews. So I made all my defensive remarks. So that's not my, I'm talking about Jewishness and Americanness, right? And she said, uh, and there weren't that many black Jews. So, so then she said to me, well, go back through each of your chapters and reread them and ask yourself this question. What if Jewishness wasn't about Americanness, like you say? What if Jewishness wasn't about the 60s, like you say? What if Jewishness wasn't about black power, as you say? What if Jewishness was really about whiteness? What if you viewed your entire topic through a racial lens rather than a nationalist lens. And I said, oh, that's really good. And in fact, I tell you the story, I have Alana's permission because that is the epilogue that I put in the book, which is my opportunity to say to the field, we have work to do. There is another version of this story to be told. I am not the one to tell it, but, uh, but when it's done, we'll be able to have a deeper and even richer understanding of this particular period. So thanks so much.